it, so I'm going to make it <laughs> worth your while. So I'm going to talk to you about how IT can partner with your clinicians, your researchers, your philanthropists to drive innovation. And in particular, how Rady Children's was able to change the way we care for kids in the critical care units through IT. So first, a little bit of context. Rady Children's is the largest pediatric provider in the state of California, also the lowest cost provider in the state of California. And we are both the provider of choice as well as a safety net for kids in the San Diego region. This is important for what I'm going to tell you because it gives us the right ingredients to do some magic. First of all, we take care of 90% of the kids in San Diego, and that gives us an ability to have data from patients across a very diverse genetic background, as well as all levels in the socioeconomic strata in our population. We also happen to have a common EHR across primary care, ED, specialty care, acute care, and long-term care. And so this is a trove of data and combined with the incredible clinicians and researchers, both at Rady and in Southern California, which happens to be the Silicon Valley of biotech, brings us all the right ingredients to do amazing things. In 2014, all these ingredients came together when our philanthropist, the Rady family, invested $120 million for us to start a genomics institute that was solely focused on pediatric. 2015, we brought in Stephen Kingsmore to run the institute, and he came to us with a grant from the NIH that was focused on rapid sequencing in the NICU. And we quickly learned that 30%, between 20 and 30% of, of infants in the uh, NICU had an underlying genomic condition that got them there. We also learned that uh, genomic defects are the leading cause of mortality in the critical care setting for infants. There are over 8,000 8, known genomic defects, many of which are treatable if we catch them in time. For instance, Imagine a baby who has a defect that prevents him from metabolizing the calcium in the mother's milk. If we don't know what's going on, that calcium accumulates and becomes poisonous. But if we can treat it quickly with a quick change in nutrition, that baby is up and running and can lead a normal life. If we don't, that calcium becomes poisonous, damaging organs that can have long-lasting effects and severely disabling the baby or even leading to their death. We estimate that somewhere between 70 and 80,000 babies born every year in the U.S. could benefit from the innovation that we've led at Rady Children's, which accounts for about 3% of the newborns in the U.S. I'm going to let you hear the story of Maverick, who's one of these patients. We couldn't see her to take the glasses off. We were scared. We, were, we didn't know what was happening. He was in pain and he wasn't able to eat. He was, uh, you know, at one point throwing up blood. And that was really, really scary. Um, we didn't know what was happening. And I was trying to stay hopeful, but um, it's hard when you see that to be hopeful. But, you know, with Reedy Children's, we figured that they were the best hospital for us in the VA. Uh, seizures are very common in young babies, and there are hundreds, it's over 850 different causes of seizures. Some things are really common, like infections, or if a baby has a fever. Uh, but in Maverick's case, these seizures just kept coming and coming, and we weren't responding to normal treatments. 
And so it's clear that there's something very serious going on. And by decoding his genome, we were able to look at all 850 conditions that can trigger, trigger a seizure and find out exactly the one which caused it in my work, <laughs> which resulted in a completely different treatment. And what's amazing is, um, as you just heard, um, Maverick was dying. And instead of that, within 36 hours, he was off all his medicines. Uh, he had the breathing tube removed. Yeah, and he was able to feed. And that was a big deal, right? That was a really big deal. Uh, and his outlook was great. Mm -hmm. And um, tragically, uh, all around the United States, other, other moms, dads, other babies aren't yet receiving this. And it can take weeks or months or even years to figure out what's the specific trigger. So Maverick is missing a single protein that makes a single type of enzyme. Uh, and we can prevent him having any symptoms by just giving him B6 and changing his diet a bit. Yeah. Uh, but you'd never know that. That's, that's not on the standard set of things that you would, you would routinely go through in a baby who's having a seizure. Uh, so he's a miracle. Um, that we found this in time before he had, you know, irreversible damage. And the great thing about babies is their brain is still growing. And so, um, you know, uh, he, he came through this and he's doing great. Yeah, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> So, amazing stuff, right? But not only is it amazing when it comes down to really changing the lives of these babies and their families, what we're seeing is that this innovative way to approach their care actually saves dollars. By getting to a quick diagnosis, in many cases, we're able to get these patients out of a very costly care setting. And we're also able to set aside procedures that were desperate with very low chance of actually making a difference because now we know whether they're gonna do anything for those babies or not. So the word got out. And next thing you know, all these other children's hospitals were wanting to get into, into this space, but not everybody had a hundred million dollars to invest in the infrastructure required to play the game. So we started serving as a reference lab for them. We now have over 26 hospitals and, uh, that are contracted with us and we have others in the pipeline. But our original workflow was not particularly scalable. And I'll walk you through it. We get patients in and enroll them and collect their samples and extract the DNA and prep it and go through the sequencing and then run this gamut of bioinformatic analysis to get uh, the genome aligned and variant column, et cetera. But on the other side, we have a very manual process where our clinicians pour through the EHR to create this uh, deep phenotype profile of the patient. And then we grab that data and merge it together with, with the data from the genome analysis and compare it to these databases that uh, list all these known genetic defects so that we can come up with a, with a diagnosis to return to the clinician. So about this time last year, I was sitting in a room with Steven and his team and my team and a couple of our vendor partners, and Steven kind of went off script and threw a challenge on the table. Why don't we automate this whole process? So if we're gonna scale this the way we're doing it, doesn't work. So we all locked arms and decided to move ahead. We started with making some changes on our intake forms and our smartphones and the NICU to try to get more discrete data. We also applied advanced natural language processing so that we could really mine the richness in the notes of those patients. But we had a problem because the EHR and our clinicians happened to speak a language that's not quite the language that our 
uh, genomics people speak, right? We're used to, I see the tan and loink, where they use human phenotype ontology. So two different ontologies that we had to mesh together. So we went ahead and did that and built some process automation and got ourselves to a place where now the physician can place an order in her electronic health record. That kicks off a set of processes that on the background extract all this data, ship it over to get combined with the data that comes from the genomic analysis, run a series of algorithms to, uh, to mine data from, from these uh, databases. And then we call it a supervised automation process. When it spits out a diagnosis, we have a well-trained human look at it, make, sense, make sure it makes sense before they push the button to then release the result to our uh, clinicians. There's a big article on science that came out last spring that describes this process in a small cohort. And one of the amazing things is that we took a process that on average takes somewhere around six weeks out in the industry. And we had been doing really, really working hard in our manual process. Uh, we had gotten it down to five to seven days. We now have it down to under a day. Have it down to 19 and a half hours. So we know that 10% of the kids in our NICUs and PICUs drive 70% of the costs. We are working now to run that same analysis on the thousand or so genomes that we have sequenced historically to validate the results that we got with that smaller cohort. Not only to see that we can do it quick, but to see that the results are as good. So in the third of our cases, we can get out a diagnosis. One in four, we actually change the way that patient is managed. And in one of five cases, we actually see a change in outcomes for the better. Impressive stuff. We couldn't do it without singular focus. That's really what it, what it took. A bunch of people from our clinical area, from our research area, from IT, from our vendor partners, working together to make it happen. Here are our success factors. First of all, we approached this without ego. It was not about IT, it was not about genomics, it was not about the convenience of our NICU physicians, it was about the patients. And we always kept that front of mind. We made sure that there was a shared vision and that shared vision was clear throughout our entire teams. It wasn't just the executive leadership that were holding hands. It was every single person that contributed to this. We kept an open mind. We went through multiple iterations, really. Reporting relationships changed. Our infrastructure changed. Our technology changed. Our partners changed. Our processes changed. But we did what we needed to do to get to the goal we were looking for. We kept a startup mindset. Then I know Bart earlier uh, this afternoon and talked about it on his uh, session about failing often and failing quickly. Right? This was all about speed, getting it done quickly. If it doesn't work, move on, let's try something else. And at the same time, the moment we became CLIA certified and we started using this for clinical care, speed was not enough. Right? Process became important. We needed it to be repeatable, we needed it to be highly available and scalable. Right? So we needed to pivot quickly. Our role was no longer trying to put all of these rocks on our backpack. It was about making it happen, and that meant collaborating and partnering and realizing when we didn't have the wherewithal to get there, we needed to ask for help. So the job at hand was to be the glue. And last but not least was the realization. It was a series of very small incremental changes right, that drove this evolution that really has revolutionized the way we care for kids in the critical care areas. That is our recipe for innovation. And my challenge to you all is what is yours. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you.